Shabbat Shalom, and welcome to Adonalam Messianic Congregation. Traditionally, often we also say Shalom Aleichem, which means to everyone, let there be peace. Uh, and peace uh, frequently in this world can be elusive. We know that true peace will not come until the Prince of Peace returns, but our hearts are certainly heavy. Uh, as we think about the uh, brutality that we have seen uh, revealed on our TV screens over this past week. Uh, and we are going to try to uh, maybe fill in the blanks for some of you, give you a little bit of a background of the history uh, of how we have gotten to this point. But we are also here for a divine appointment with the creator of the universe. Uh, and in the scriptures, we see that uh, he will watch over and protect his people. We've seen in the suzerainty treaty that we've been talking about, that that's a promise that he makes. And so we trust that he will uh, watch over and protect our people, Israel, and we pray even miraculously uh, that he would protect those who were taken hostage. Uh, we also ask him to uh, bless this service uh, because we are here to emphasize the Jewishness of Messiah Yeshua, the Jewishness of our New Covenant faith. And one of the ways that we do that is by using Hebrew uh, in our songs and in our prayers. But we translate because we see ourselves as a community uh, described as the one new man by Rabbi Shaul, the Apostle Paul, in Ephesians chapter 2. Jew and Gentile coming together to worship as one. And so um, we trust that the Lord will bless as we observe this weekly divine appointment that he has established for his purposes. And so um, we uh, are blessed that the creator of the universe uh, is going to meet with us this evening. And I, I trust uh, that this will be a blessing to you. We are going to uh, begin our service with the lighting of the Sabbath candles. And I'm going to ask Janiel Scott to usher in the Sabbath uh, for us and ask you to direct your attention to the front at this time. As frequently we have two candles that are lit because we're told to uh, shamor, to observe or to keep the Sabbath, and to zahur, to remember the Sabbath, lakadsho, to keep it holy. Thank you, Janiel. And now I'm going to call up our cantor for the evening, Eli Scott, uh, and ask you to please stand as we will be chanting the prayer known as the Shema, a prayer that is based on Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. And in this prayer, once again, as a community, we affirm the oneness, the uniqueness of our God. Yeshua referred to the first line of the Shema as the greatest commandment. We'll chant the Hebrew, uh, the prayer in Hebrew, then recite the English translation, followed by the Hebrew of the verses that come afterwards in Deuteronomy 6, known as the Via Hafta, and that will also be followed by the English translation. Together, the Shema. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Hear, 
O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his glorious name, whose kingdom is forever and ever. And now the be a Together. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them upon the doorposts of your house, and on your gates, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Amen. Please join me uh, as we ask the Lord to bless this service, and we also ask him to uh, watch over and protect our people Israel. Eloheinu velohavotenu, Elohim raham, Elohei Yitzchak, Elohei Yaakov. Our God and God of our fathers, Lord, we just come before you this evening. And Lord, we ask you to bless uh, this service. We ask you to uh, watch over and protect our people, Israel. We ask you to, uh, Lord, just uh, cause there to be a minimal uh, loss of life, injuries on both sides, Lord, uh, that um, you would be revealed as not only the creator of the universe, but the one who sent your son as the only way of reconciliation between man and, and our creator. And Lord, we pray that you would watch over uh, every congregation around the world that is meeting at this time, Lord, uh, that you would just um, help us to remember that he that keepeth Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps, that Adonai Sibaot, the Lord of hosts, is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And Lord, uh, we trust in you. We trust in you for uh, blessing, uh, using situation that seems uh, like many are uh, looking at as hopeless, Lord, you are always able to provide the hope, Lord. Uh, our people, our people of hope, their national anthem uh, is entitled the hope. And Lord, we pray that you would comfort those who have suffered loss, uh, loss of loved ones or even loved ones uh, taken captive. And Lord, we ask you to uh, just supernaturally watch over and protect uh, those who have been taken hostage. But Lord, most importantly, we realize uh, that you are our hope in this situation. We trust in you. We believe that you are able to use this uh, in some way that will bring glory to your name. And Lord, we just desire your anointing on this service, on the singing, on the dancing, the worship, the praise, the message, the liturgy, the fellowship, all that we do this evening, Lord. We just ask you to bless, to watch over, to protect, and to bring glory to you. We ask it in Messiah Yeshua's name. Amen. <clears throat> you may be seated, and now I'm going to call up Rebecca Haberman to bring us our announcements for this week. Shabbat Shalom, and welcome to Adon Alam Messianic Congregation. If you're a first time visitor, please raise your hand so that we might recognize you. And seeing none tonight, we will move on. Um, we're continuing the demolition of much of the interior of our new building. 
Uh, we're planning another workday this Sunday between 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. We encourage you to be there whenever you can in that time frame. You can bring yard tools if you prefer outside work or bring gloves, goggles, and masks if you have them to safely work on the inside. We will attempt to give everyone a chance to assist in this effort regardless of skill level. You can even come just to offer moral support. This Tuesday, the Jewish community is planning a gathering for community support of Israel. This coming Tuesday again at 6 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. We are planning to attend and then we will be continuing our class on the subject of sharing Messiah with sensitivity. This week we will be talking about messianic terminology. We will also have our beginning Hebrew class afterward. One week from this Sunday on October 22nd at 10 a.m., we will be taking down our sukkah. All are welcome to help with the effort. Later that day at 5 p.m., a local group called One Prayer will be bringing upstate believers together to pray for our local community. Our rabbi will be one of the leaders for this event, which will take place at Renovation Church in Simpsonville. We have cards on our material table if you want additional information. Now we pray the Lord's blessings upon you and hope that you'll feel his sweet spirit as you worship with us this evening. Once again, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, Rebecca. I just want to make um, one uh, additional announcement connected to what we've already said. Um, they announced earlier in the week that they were gonna, going to have this time of community support, but they were not the, the details came out bit by bit, um, and it was just uh, as I was getting ready to leave for the service tonight that I finally found out when it was going to be held. Uh, and um, basically, uh, we are all invited, but um, we have to sign up to be able to come. It requires registration. So if you are interested, see me afterwards, and I will get you the information so that you can sign up. Now we are going to chant the traditional prayer known as the Vishamru, which means, and they shall keep. This prayer uh, is the Hebrew of Exodus 31, verses 16 and 17. Uh, and after we chant the Hebrew, we will have the English translation, followed by a Messianic paragraph that we have added to the end. Together, the Vishamru. Vishamru, Yisrael, The children of Israel shall keep the Shabbat to observe it throughout their generations as an everlasting covenant. 
It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he ceased from work and rested. And we know our Messiah Yeshua observed the Shabbat. In the New Covenant Scriptures we are told, as was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Amen. Now we are going to enter into the scripture portion of our service. I will call forward our ARC opener, Randall Anderson, as well as Fred Scott, who will be uh, leading us in this portion of the service. And we would ask as the ARC is open that you would please stand. The ARC reminds us of the Ark of the Covenant, uh, <clears throat> the uh, place where the presence of the Lord could be found. It's the traditional name for the furniture that houses the scroll, known as the Torah, which contains the first five books of the Bible, known as the five books of Moses. And tonight we will be starting from the very beginning. Amen. <clears throat> and it came to pass, whenever the ark went forward, Moses would say, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. May those who hate you flee from before you. For from Zion shall go forth the Torah, and the word of the Lord out of Jerusalem. Blessed be he who in holiness gave the Torah to his people Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Unique is our God, great is our Lord, holy and revered is his name. Magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and the earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mount. For the Lord our God is holy. Amen. I will now ask our scripture reader to come forward. He who blessed our fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may he bless Simcha Dov bin Ruvin, who has come up to honor God and his word. May the Holy One bless him and his family and send blessing and prosperity on all the work of his hands. Amen. 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 And now for the blessing before the reading of the Torah. Baruch Adonai Hamvorach. Bless the Lord who is blessed. Baruch Adonai Hamvorach Le'olam Ba'ed Bless the Lord who is blessed forever and ever. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Ha'olam Asher Bachar Benu Minkol Ha'amim Benatan Lanu Et Torato Baruch Atah Adonai Noten HaTorah Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who chose us from all peoples and gave us the Torah. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. This is the 29th day of the seventh month on the Hebrew calendar, the month of Tishri. Our Torah reading for this evening is taken from Genesis chapter 1, verses 31 through chapter 2, verse 4. In Hebrew, the name of the book is Bereshit. We'll be reading from chapter 1, verses 31 through chapter 2, verse 4, found on page 2 in the Complete Jewish Bible. Shabbat Shalom. Uh, before I begin, I want to say thank you to everyone um, for celebrating an anniversary with me. Um, this is the anniversary of my bar mitzvah, and my Torah portion was uh, Bereshit, um, the first five verses. And last week, God blessed me for the first time that I can remember. I actually saw, once again, the exact portion I read at my bar mitzvah. So I thought that was a huge blessing and an honor um, from, from the Lord. So um, I'm going to be reading verses... Chapter 1, verses 31 to chapter 2, uh, verses till verse uh, 4. 
God saw everything that he made, that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So there was evening and there was morning a sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, along with everything in them. On the seventh day was finished with his work which he had made. So he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. God blessed the seventh day and separated it as holy, because on that day God rested from all his work which he had created, so that it itself could produce. Here is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created, on the day when Adonai, God, made earth and heaven. Amen. Amen. The blessing following the reading of the Torah. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech olam, asher natan lanu Torah emet, v'chai olam nata v'tocheinu, Baruch atah Adonai, noten ha-Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and life everlasting planted in our midst. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. And now for the congregational response following the reading of the Torah. There's a Torah, Asher Samoshe, Lifne Bene Yisrael, Alpiadona. Its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all its paths are peace. Turn us, O Lord, to you, and let us return. Renew our days as of old. Amen. Amen. And now for the blessing before the reading of the Haftarah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who chose good prophets, delighting in their words which were spoken truthfully. Blessed are you, O Lord, who chose the Torah, your servant Moses, your people Israel, and the prophets of truth and righteousness. Amen. Amen. Our Haftarah portion for this evening is from Isaiah chapter 42, verses 5 through 8. In Hebrew, the name of the book is Yeshiahu Hanavi. We'll be reading from chapter 42, verses 5 through 8, found on page 500 in the Complete Jewish Bible. Thus says God Adonai, who created the heavens and spread them out, who stretched out the earth and all that grows from it, who gives breath to the people on it, and spirit to those who walk on it. I, Adonai, called you righteously. I took hold of you by the hand. I shaped you and made you a covenant for, for the people to be a light for the goyim, so that you can open blind eyes, free the prisoners from confinement, those living in darkness from the dungeon. I am Adonai, that is my name. I yield my glory to no one else, nor my praise to any idol. 
Amen. The blessing following the reading of the Haftarah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, rock of all ages, righteous throughout all generations. You are the faithful God, promising and then performing, first speaking, then fulfilling, for all your words are true and righteous. Faithful are you, O Lord our God, and faithful are your words, for no word of yours shall remain unfulfilled. You are a faithful and merciful God and King. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, who are faithful and fulfilling your words. Amen. And now the blessing before the reading of the New Covenant Scriptures. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech olam, Asher natan lanu Mashiach Yeshua, Vehadibro shel halbrit ha'adashah. Baruch atah Adonai, Noteh halbrit ha'adashah. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us Messiah Yeshua and the words of the renewed covenant. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the new covenant. Amen. Our Brit portion for tonight is from John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In Hebrew, the name of the book is Yochanan HaShaliach. We'll be reading from chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, found on page 1329 in the Complete Jewish Bible. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things came to be through Him, and without Him nothing made had, had, had been. In Him was life, and the life was the light of mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not suppressed it. Yes. Amen. 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 And now the blessing following the reading of the New Covenant Scriptures. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan lanu haibar haemet, vechai leolam nata betocheinu, Baruch atah Adonai, noetei habrit lachadashah. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the word of truth and life everlasting planted in our midst. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the renewed covenant. Amen. When the ark rested, Moses would say, Return, O Lord, to the myriads of Israel's families. Arise, O Lord, to your resting place, you and your mighty ark. Clothe your priests with righteousness. May those who have experienced your faithful love shout for joy. Hallelujah. For the sake of your servant David, do not delay the return of your Messiah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who gives us the living word and the Messiah, Yeshua. Amen. Amen. When the ark is closed, you may be seated. Please join me in reciting, He being merciful. He being merciful forgives iniquity and does not destroy. Frequently he turns away his anger and does not stir up all his wrath. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving and exceedingly kind to all who call upon you. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The blood of Yeshua, our Messiah, cleanses us from all sin. Amen. We're going to do something a little bit different tonight um, because I thought that uh, it's good to sometimes look at what has happened in the past so that we can understand uh, why we are seeing the things we are seeing in the present. And as a result... Um, I'm going to cover a little bit of history, and then we will um, dismiss the young people to uh, go and have a class. Last week, we observed the final appointed time of the year, Shemini Atzeret, often referred to as the eighth day of Sukkot. 
And at the end of the evening, we started hearing reports about rocket attacks taking place in Israel, which that's not the most unusual thing, unfortunately. But by the next day, uh, we found out that Israel had experienced a full-scale invasion by terrorists attacking people at a music festival, as well as families living in kibbutzim, collective communities, and moshavim, farming villages near the Israel-Gaza border. Our hearts are impacted. They're uh, heavy, even broken, with the brutality that our people have experienced. And we pray the Lord's comfort to those impacted by the loss or capture of loved ones. And our hearts also go out to those who have been injured. And we offer up prayers asking the Lord to protect our people from the rockets still being launched into Israel, to protect those taken captive, and miraculously enable them to be able to return to their families. And we pray for peace even though we know that peace will not come until the Prince of Peace comes and will finally be able to deliver Israel uh, out of the hands of those who seek to destroy her. Most of all, we pray for the Lord's will to be done. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Avinu Malkenu, our Father, our King, Lord, uh, we trust that you are able to uh, comfort our people in times of sorrow that many have not known uh, since uh, the days of the Holocaust. Uh, Lord, we pray um, that you would miraculously, supernaturally protect uh, those who have been taken hostage and enable them to be returned to their families. And Lord, we uh, thank you that even in the scriptures we find that days that are days of mourning, and here it was actually a day of rejoicing that has been turned into a day of mourning, but Lord, you tell us that days of mourning will be turned into days of joy and feasting, and we are trusting that that will be the case um, for our people and uh, our ability to celebrate in the future. Lord, we um, just intercede uh, before you, realizing that we have gone astray in so many ways. And Lord, we just ask you to bless our nation uh, and that we would continue to support Israel, uh, that we would accomplish your purposes. And Lord, we just uh, trust you for blessing in this situation. And Lord, I desire that as we explore the history uh, and as we explore truths in your word tonight, that it would comfort us to see that you are in charge over all. You are every, able to use every situation for your glory. And now I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable in your sight. My rock and my redeemer, I ask it in Yeshua's name. Amen. Okay, so this is going to be a rather brief uh, explanation. We've covered a lot of this on Israeli Independence Day when we give a lot of history of how Israel came into being, um, but we're going to cover, going to cover some things tonight that we uh, have not covered before. But first we have to start way back uh, in Genesis 17 verse 8 where we find that God gave the land of Canaan, Canaan, to Abraham and his descendants as an everlasting possession. So in terms of divine decree, we already know to whom the land belongs. It belongs to the Lord, and he has chosen through uh, his covenant with Abraham to give them the land as an everlasting possession. Fast forward to 1947, when the UN passed Resolution 181 creating a Jewish state and an Arab state, as shown in the slide. The Jewish people did not have access to Jerusalem, which would be under international control and surrounded by the Arab state. Even though Jerusalem had been our capital all the way back to the days of King David, Israel voted in favor of the resolution 
and every Arab nation voted against it. The people called the Palestinians today were not a separate people at this point. Jewish people living in the land were called Palestinian Jews, and the Arabs living in the land were called Palestinian Arabs. It wasn't until 1948, when Israel declared independence, that the Jewish people claimed the land that had been granted to them in 1947. After Israel declared its independence, five Arab nations declared war against Israel. The Jewish people told the Arabs living in Israel that if they stayed, which some did, they would be offered full Israeli citizenship. But Arab leaders told the people to leave because, quote, all the millions the Jews had spent on land and economic development would be easy spoils. It will be a simple matter to drive the Jews into the sea, unquote. Some left voluntarily, some were forced out, but they all ended up either in the West Bank, controlled by Jordan, or in Gaza, controlled by Egypt. The West Bank is a term the world uses for what Israel refers to as Judea and Samaria. Both the Jordanians and the Egyptians refused to grant the Palestinian refugees citizenship. In 1964, the refugees came under the leadership of the Palestine Liberation Organization, the PLO, which is a secular organization. Uh, they are not fighting uh, based on Muslim principles. They are fighting to achieve a political aim, even though they were willing to use terrorism to do it. In 1967, at the end of the Six-Day War, Israel gained control of Jerusalem, the West Bank, and Gaza. In 1969, Yasser Arafat became leader of the PLO and began a long-term terror war against Israel, culminating in the first Intifada, or Palestinian uprising, which uh, began in 1987 and lasted until 1994 when Israel and the PLO agreed to what are known as the Oslo Peace Accords. Israel began handing over cities to the PLO, and by this time, uh, under the agreement, they came to be known as the Palestinian Authority, or the PA. Then in 2005, Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon decided to force all Israelis to leave Gaza and handed it over to the Palestinians under the new PA leader, Mahmoud Abbas. In 2006, the Palestinians in Gaza voted to give Hamas a majority in the legislature. And in 2007, after a brief civil war, Hamas drove the Palestinian Authority out of Gaza and have ruled without any more elections since. Hamas receives funding and weapons from Iran and had periodically fired rockets or executed terrorist attacks in Israel. In response, Israel has bombed or even gone into Gaza, but once pressure starts to be exerted on Israel um, to cease the operation primarily from the left wing of uh, the United States and Israel, uh, they would agree to a ceasefire with Hamas. Now, in the Muslim world, when your enemy has an advantage over you, you agree to what the Muslims refer to as a hudna, uh, a ceasefire that enables you to rebuild your capabilities until you are strong enough to attack again. Hamas sees their efforts as waging a holy war. Their charter calls for the total elimination of the Jewish people from the land of Israel. The PA rules the West Bank, and that briefly gives you an idea of how we have gotten to where we are at this point. A holy war is being uh, waged from those who are in Gaza. There's also Hezbollah, which means party of God, to the north in Lebanon. And both of those uh, terrorist organizations are proxies of Iran. And we certainly uh, need the Lord's blessing both on Israel because uh, they are looking not only at the possibility of trying to wipe out Hamas with a war against 
uh, them, but also there's the issue of will Hezbollah attack from the north, and Syria has already launched rockets into Israel as well. Uh, and so um, this could easily become a, a regional um, conflict, and we could very well find ourselves uh, taking on Iran or even those who are lined up with Iran, Russia, and China. So um, we really need the Lord uh, to bless, and I think that we have entered a, a new phase uh, in terms of wars in this world because um, this one just has the potential uh, to really become much more involved than it is at this point. Now I'm going to uh, dismiss the young people to go have a class where you, where you will learn what I am about to talk about. But hopefully uh, that really brief lesson gives you an idea of what the Israelis are facing uh, and the different groups in the region that threaten Israel uh, and also their, their um, varying philosophies. So now I want to talk about the Torah portion. And I would actually argue this is the most significant Torah portion that there is. The portion begins the book of Genesis, which means origins. The Hebrew name of the book and its first portion come from the first word, Bereshi, uh, meaning in the beginning. And while there are varying views amongst believers, I'm going to try and simplify things by boiling it down to two possibilities uh, regarding Genesis 1. It all boils down to how you view the first three words of Genesis. Bereshit bara Elohim. In the beginning created, God created in the English grammar. If one accepts that God creates, there should be little difficulty in accepting the rest of the creation account. Otherwise, efforts are often directed at reconciling Genesis 1 with what science would tell us. We can either believe in a miraculous creation by an all-powerful God, or we can see the rest of the creation account as man's effort to explain the formation of the universe based on a series of totally random events. Here are some of the implications of seeing the account of Genesis 1 as an accurate and reliable account of the creation of the universe. Number one, if God is creator, he decides what is right and wrong. Morality in this world is not relative or subject to human manipulations. We've seen many different sides being expressed in the events of this past week, but there is only one truth. We don't decide what is right and what is wrong. We don't decide what is true. He does. Number two, life is something very special. It is not based merely on chance. Each one of us has been created with a purpose by an all-knowing, all-powerful God who is the creator of the universe. He is able to use us as his vessels to accomplish his purposes. Number three, if we can rely on the account of Genesis 1, then we don't have to figure out where science stops and scripture starts being reliable. Instead, we can agree with Paul, Shaul, who tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, literally God breathed. Number four, there then can be more to our lives than what we experience in this world. Miracles, including life after death, become possible. His revelation through his written word tells us of life beyond the grave, as we find in Daniel 12, verses 1 and 2, for example, giving us the hope that we are going to spend the rest of eternity, the eternity that follows our physical death, 
in his presence. We've seen death, we've seen suffering on our television screens, but the reality is that when we take an eternal perspective, the ultimate weapon of this world has been defeated by our creator. And he sent his son to demonstrate that. His resurrection is demonstrated, a demonstration that death uh, will not hold us uh, into the physical limitations of this world. One day we will have glorified bodies. One day we will dwell in the presence of the creator of the universe. Number five, we have supernatural assistance against the evil that unfortunately is part of a fallen world where man has free will. And every so often, uh, we are reminded of the depravity that man is able to go to, um, especially man who is not being led by the Lord, but is allowing uh, the temptations of power and the uh, spirits of this world to rule them. And uh, I think we felt that we saw that in 9-11 in our country with the brutality and the lack of concern uh, for those who were on those planes or in those buildings, but supposedly uh, the people had an agenda and were serving their God. Uh, we serve a God of life. He encourages us to choose life. And uh, he does not ask us to die to prove our purpose. The only thing that we know about death is the question is, are we willing to die if it should come to whether or not we're willing to take a stand for the Lord? Because Revelation says that that is the way we overcome, um, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony and not uh, loving our lives even unto death. The final uh, blessing that comes from seeing the account of Genesis 1 as accurate is in foxholes. And when storms come into our lives, we have someone to pray to. By the way, along those lines, have you ever noticed that after a natural disaster, what do people always say? Why, God? Why did this happen? But they don't ask this question when they're spared from the disaster. They don't ask this question when they're being blessed. They don't ask this question when they decide to terminate an unwanted pregnancy. The reality is we have a creator. He has given us his instructions as to how we are to live. But the only time we question is when something happens to uh, us and, and particularly in the world that seems unfair. But the reality is we live in a fallen world. But ultimately our God is uh, able to overcome the unfairness of this world and the ultimate demonstration of that is offering us the uh, free gift of salvation because of the sacrifice of his son uh, we receive what we don't deserve he received what he did not deserve and that enables us to receive what we don't deserve believing in a creator is more than just trusting him following a natural disaster it also means that we've been created with a specific purpose that we are designed to fulfill. Each of us is uniquely equipped, gifted, and experienced for what God has called us to do. But we have to overcome the fallenness of this world in our lives as we seek to fulfill our destiny. In this portion, we actually see the very uh, roots of this fallenness. We see the fall take place, uh, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. We can also search for additional evidence for accepting the creation account. We actually mentioned something last week uh, that ties into the first five verses of Genesis, where we saw that uh, at the beginning of the book, the word Torah was spelled out based on taking every 50th letter in the first five verses. And we're putting that up on the slide once again. Wow. Now, you know, that could happen by random chance. 
until we see the exact same thing in the book of Exodus. And now the odds are going up drastically. Actually, the odds of this occurring a second time at the same location, the beginning of the book, are not one in a million, not one in a billion, but right around one in a trillion. So to me, and, and the reality is that if one letter was added or one letter was taken away, that pattern would, not, would fall apart. And speaking of patterns, we should also note that six times in Genesis chapter 1 it says, Ketov, which means it was good. But as we read earlier in Genesis 1 verse 31, after the sixth day, the day that man was created, the Lord says, Vahine tov meod, and behold, it was very good. The world and some believers have bought into a different explanation. Most who buy into the scientific explanation would tell us that billions and billions of years ago, there was a huge cosmic explosion of some sort of primordial soup that somehow had come into existence. I often refer to it as believing the universe started from some sort of cosmic pond scum. Because the question is, where did this material come from? They don't know. But they're nonetheless certain this is how it happened. Before I became a believer, I had bought into their seeming certainty. But now I see how they minimize the large black holes in their theories, such as where did this pond scum come from? I'm kind of referring, if you've ever seen a pool, uh, you know, you can have like crystal clear water and all of a sudden over time, uh, if you don't take steps to maintain the purity of the water, uh, life will start to grow in that, that pool and sometimes it'll be a complete dark green if it's uh, left to go long enough. And I use the technical term pond scum for that. Um, <clears throat> so speaking of black holes, last year I watched a TV show that had astrophysicists explaining what black holes were. Um, and I think that it is very important to them, the, the concept, uh, because they see it as the basis for what they refer to as the Big Bang. So I figured I'd see what they had to say. Um, <clears throat> the very first thing they said was that they'd never seen a black hole, though they were certain that they could be found at the center of every galaxy. And mind you, there are billions and billions of galaxies. Uh, they also said that mathematical, mathematical models of a black hole ended up with infinite mass at the center, which they felt was impossible. So they came up with a number of modifications to explain the existence of the black holes. But each modification had its own set of problems, including the fact that the explanation they offered in the modification was something else that they had never seen. I think their problem just might be their initial assumption that some random event produced what they call the Big Bang. As a believer, I no longer see myself as a random collection of molecules. Though once again, I have to point out that that is what I believed uh, as a younger person and all of my Jewish family believed pretty much the same thing. I no longer believe our world came from cosmic pond scum I no longer believe Magilla, Bonzo, King Kong, and I have a common ancestor. I'm not related to the monkeys or the beetles, and neither are you. In Genesis 1 verse 3, God speaks light into existence. But according to Genesis 1 verses 16 and 19, he doesn't create the sun and the other stars until the fourth day. Now, there are skeptics who believe that the Bible is just uh, man using the supernatural to explain what we otherwise cannot. If that were true, I don't think anyone would describe light as being created three days before the sun and the other stars. Over the rest of the six days, God speaks and our universe comes into existence. And then according to Genesis 2 verse 2, he rests on the seventh day. And he blesses the seventh day as a day of rest. And he sanctifies it. He sets it apart. He makes it holy for his purposes. And then he established it as a day of rest 
for us in what I sometimes call, uh, in an attempt at humor, the Big Ten. And I'm referring to the Ten Commandments, but they're not called the Ten Commandments in the scriptures. They're referred to as the Ten Words. Um, nonetheless, in Exodus 20, uh, verses 8 through 10, it starts out to Zachor, to remember the Sabbath day, Lakad show, to keep it holy. And this idea is repeated in Deuteronomy 5, verse 12, but here it says to Shamor, to observe the Sabbath, Lakad show, once again, to keep it holy. And actually, that term, keep it holy, that Hebrew could also be translated as for his holiness. Uh, it could be talking about the Sabbath. It could be talking about the Lord. Uh, and so this may be another case where we are to be holy. We are to follow his instructions about holiness because he is holy. The Lord has instructed his people to pause one day each week to remember his work in creating this world. It's easy to get caught up in the events that are going on in the world. It's easy to get caught up in our day-to-day -day struggles. Uh, it's easy to get caught up in the ways of the flesh. But the reality is he gives us one day each week to say, stop, take a break from everything that you're doing and turn your attention to my eternal truths. Just rest from everything you're doing so that you will be able to reflect that I am the creator, that I created this world in six days and set up the seventh day as a day of rest. Also, um, in these instructions, in both Exodus and Deuteronomy, it also specifies who is to observe the Sabbath. And it refers to your manservant and your maidservant and even your animals. But both lists also include Gercha, Asher, Bish Arecha, which means your sojourner within your gates. We constantly see the Lord referring to the one who is not a physical part of the community by blood, but nonetheless goes through all of the observances, is able to partake in the worship experiences, uh, and is able to raise their children within the community as, as part of the community. And we see them referred to over and over. And we found in the Messianic community that our in the 70s, we thought that it was just going to be all of the Jewish people who had come to believe in Yeshua as the Messiah. But what we found in, in the synagogue was there were more and more people coming to be a part of what was happening, to join our fellowship, to be a part of our community that were not raised Jewish, but realized that they were followers of a Jewish Messiah and that they, their faith, uh, their salvation was based on a Jewish new covenant faith. And so uh, the reality is the messianic movement, there are more sojourners in our movement than there are native born uh, Israelis with the exception of uh, in Israel. And so uh, we trust that the Lord would watch over and protect our people in Israel. Uh, the, the messianic community had uh, experienced a significant amount of persecution uh, in recent times. But I, I have a feeling that Israel is overcoming all of its differences to focus on what really threatens it. And the threats are primarily from without, much more than within. And so um, even in the, the invitation I got to attend the uh, Greenville Jewish community uh, vigil, on behalf of our people Israel, uh, it, it said that you had to sign up in advance and, and pre-register. And so uh, I wrote back a little email and I said, is it okay for me to invite my congregation? And I signed it, Todd Lesser, a don't alum messianic congregation. And the response was, sure. So um, if, if you're interested in being a part of that, you can see me afterwards. And um, I'll get the email to you so that you can register. But once again, when we're being attacked from without, the Jewish community tends to focus more on what we have in common 
than the differences that separate us at other times. In Genesis 2, verse 7, we find that God forms Ha'adam, uh, the man from the ground, Ha'adama. In Genesis 2, verses 15 through 17, the Lord puts the man in the garden and gives him one commandment. He may eat of every tree in the garden except one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then in Genesis 2, verse 18, the Lord makes a perfect helper, an Ezer Kenegdo uh, in the Hebrew, for Ha'adam. She is called Isha, woman, because she came from Ish, man. Later in Genesis 3, verse 20, the man gives the woman the name of Chava, even the English, because she was the mother of all living. <coughs> you know, we see in these names, and frequently in the Hebrew scriptures, names have meaning. Uh, they're, they're assigned as part of an expression of what we are going to do, or who we are, or what we have done. And so when we name our children, uh, we often take that into account. And we try and look up Hebrew names so that people will know uh, what names they, uh, the Hebrew for the, the description that they want their child to carry for the rest of their lives. As a Jewish kid growing up, I didn't know anyone that believed Adam and Eve had actually ever existed. But now I see Adam and Eve and their rebellion against God's instructions as an actual event. I see the fall of Adam and Eve as an explanation for the sad state of affairs in our world today. And I see the account of their fall as helping us to understand everything that has come afterward, to see that God in his grace began the process immediately of restoring things to the way they were before the fall. The fall is described in Genesis chapter 3, where we find that there is trouble in paradise, literally. Satan, the adversary, Satan, in the form of a serpent, gets Eve to eat fruit from the one tree that they were not to eat from. And she gives the fruit to Adam, who knows he is not supposed to eat it. As a result, according to Genesis 3 verse 7, they sow fig leaves together to cover themselves as they embark upon the world's oldest occupation, seeking to hide their sins from God. When the Lord asks them what they've done, they embark upon the world's second oldest occupation, blaming things on someone else. Adam says in Genesis 3 verse 12, it was Eve who gave him the fruit. And not only that, Adam tries to blame the Lord who had given this woman to him. In Genesis 3.13, Eve blames the serpent. And before we laugh at the scene, we might ask ourselves, are things all that different today? We often blame others for our own failings, don't we? And like Adam, who are we ultimately blaming? The Lord, right? We even see some in our world today blaming the Jewish people for the brutal murder of their own children. The irony is the ones who killed the Jewish children have no problem using their children as human shields. In Genesis 3 verse 24, Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden for their rebellion. And our only hope at this point is that God will provide a way of restoration. And in Genesis 3, verse 15, we find that that is exactly what he is going to do through the seed of the woman who will crush the head of the seed of the serpent. Now, for just a minute, I want to talk about several scripture passages that treat Genesis chapters 1 through 3 as literal events. You know, a lot of people view the... Uh, account in Genesis 1, and they're like, there's no way that that could mean literally what it says. But if we look further down the road, we find that people are referring to those events as though they actually happened. It gives us reason uh, to believe that as well. Um, we actually have already uh, chanted and then translated one, the Vishamru, Exodus 31, verse 17, Moses says the Lord made the heavens and the earth in six days and rested on the seventh day. In Matthew 19, verses 4 and 5, in response to the Pharisees' question about divorce, 
Yeshua quotes Genesis 2 verse 24 saying, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And for this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. In Luke 3 verses 23 and 38, Yeshua's ancestry is traced all the way back to Adam. In Romans 5, verses 12 through 14, Paul talks about sin and death entering the world through one man, Adam. In 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3, the Corinthians are warned not to make the same mistake as Eve, whom Paul describes as having been beguiled by the serpent in his craftiness, or and his craftiness. In 1 Timothy 2, verses 13 and 14, Paul points out that it was Eve who was deceived also describing Adam as the first one who was formed and then Eve. So that is just some of the evidence that we find later on in the scriptures suggesting creation of the universe by a creator. Now I want to talk briefly about tonight's New Covenant scripture portion. As we heard earlier, John 1.1, like Genesis, starts out in the beginning. But John is describing Yeshua as being part of the creation process. John 1 verse 3 says, All things were made through him, and apart from him nothing was made that has come into being. John then tells us in verses 4 and 5 that the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness does not comprehend it. The world cannot comprehend the work of Yeshua. It is folly to them particularly when they just listen to what others say instead of reading the scriptures for themselves. That's why we try, when we share with people, we try to explain what to them otherwise would be folly. And we show it to them out of the scriptures because the Lord says his word will not return unto him void. The reality is uh, it's not about our understanding it's about what the scriptures say and getting people to read it for themselves now maybe up until tonight you've had difficulty comprehending the work of yeshua maybe like i thought back in my teens you believe the accounts of creation and adam and eve to be fairy tales perhaps you didn't understand that we have a creator whom we refer to as the king of the universe who has a very special purpose for the lives of each and every one here. It was such a blessing when I came to faith and realized that there was meaning to my life, that, that I had been called for a purpose, that I could figure out perhaps what that was. Because one of the questions I had before I came to faith is, why am I here? What's going to happen after I die? Uh, the, these were questions that I didn't have good answers for, and I just kind of wondered. Nobody else seemed to have any answers either. Uh, but um, when somebody shared with me that um, the Hebrew Scriptures had passages that I didn't even know existed that addressed God providing restoration for the rebellion of mankind, it, it spoke to me. He shared with me from Isaiah 53. And I was absolutely convinced that those words would not be found in my Jewish Bible. And then I opened my Jewish Bible and I found out the same words he shared with me from his Christian Bible were right there in my Jewish Bible. And uh, it did not take me long. The more scriptures I looked at from the Hebrew scriptures, the more I saw that um, God was going to provide a way of reconciliation. He was going to deal with the problem created by the fall way back uh, in Genesis 15, uh, Genesis 3, verse 15. The, the fall that I didn't even believe, uh, the fall of Adam and Eve, people that I didn't even believe existed. So, you know, many of us uh, think we understand things, but the scriptures contain the eternal truths of our God. We cannot rely on man's un understanding. You're going to hear all sorts of theories about what is going on in the world right now. But the reality is if we want to understand what is going on in the world, we really need to search out the scriptures and see what God has revealed uh, through his revelation that he has provided to us as a blessing. Today I know we serve a God who loves us, who cares about us, who has a plan for us, 
who sent his son to endure abuse, torture, and death so that our sins, yours and mine, could be forgiven. What a blessing it is to know the truths of the Bible instead of believing the fairy tales that man, and I would almost put science, uh, often comes up with. I'm not descended from an ape, and neither are you. I'm a purposeful creation of the creator of the universe, and so are you. And I believe that the scriptures reveal that because of the work of Messiah Yeshua and my accepting his sacrifice on my behalf, I will spend the rest of eternity in the presence of a holy and righteous God. And you can do that as well. If you haven't accepted his sacrifice before, you can do that tonight. So I would ask with eyes closed and heads bowed. Tonight, you can receive the free gift that I talked about, the gift of salvation. And all you have to do to say, I want to receive Messiah's sacrifice on my behalf is just raise your hand and you can put it right back down. Is there anyone? We always give that opportunity. We never take for granted everybody's made that decision. And there may be somebody watching this on video. And if you feel the Lord revealing that you need to accept the sacrifice of Messiah Yeshua tonight, if you feel like you are raising your hand wherever you are, we would just encourage you to contact us by text or email and let us know. Or even through our Facebook page. But for those of us who are already followers of Yeshua, maybe you've been hiding something from God, uh, feeling like he would be disappointed if he knew. If we think about it, he already knows, and he still loves us. He sees the waywardness of our Jewish people, and yet he remains faithful to them which gives us confidence he will remain faithful to us. He will fulfill his promises to us. He desires for us to return to him. Our flesh may lead us into darkness, but he calls us to come out of the darkness, to repent of whatever mistakes we have made in the past, that we might walk in his marvelous light. Or maybe you've been blaming others for your shortcomings. I think we all do that at some point. These days, I think the expression, this might be a little outdated, we need to own it. Own up to our own weaknesses and not blame them to other, on others. Admit to the areas where we fall short so the Lord can begin a work in our lives to help us in those areas. Or perhaps you've argued with other believers about their position on creation. You know, we have to acknowledge none of us knows for sure exactly how things happened. But the important part is agreeing that we have a creator who has a plan for our lives. To trust that nothing happens in this world merely by chance. If you're willing to start making changes in one of these areas or even some other area that the Lord may have shown you tonight, I would just ask you once again with eyes closed and heads bowed, just raise your hand to signify, to say, Lord, yes. I want to fulfill my purpose that you have designed me for. And Lord, I want you to take any area that you have shown me tonight uh, where I, I need to um, work on it and, and need your help so that I might be able to fulfill what you have called me to in a greater way. All you have to do is raise your hand as a sign that that is a commitment that you are making. As Lord, we thank you that your word is true. And we thank you that we are not here by random events, that you have a purpose for each one of us, that you are a mighty God who created the heavens and the earth and everything in them, including each one of us. And tonight, Lord, we bless you as we seek your blessing on each one who is here. We ask you to bless our people, Israel. We ask you to watch over and protect them and give them wisdom. Uh, as they uh, find themselves waging war against their enemies, Lord, we know that with you on their side, they can have the victory. There can be minimal casualties, and your purposes can be accomplished. May the leaders of that nation trust in you even more than their weapons of war. And Lord, we ask you to bless the rest of this service and all that we do this evening and in the days ahead. 
And we ask these things in our Messiah Yeshua's name. Amen. And amen. Uh, at this point, I'm going to call up our cantor as we resume our service with the blessing over the fruit of the vine and the bread. Then we will um, pronounce the blessing that we pronounce at the end of the service from number six. And then uh, we will be singing the Israeli national anthem, the Hatikva, uh, as our closing song. As I just felt like um, I was actually watching an interview on TV and the people in the background uh, broke out in the Hatikva. And it sounded a lot like what we've heard uh, on Israel Independence Day. Uh, where um, the people did the same thing spontaneously uh, when they heard that uh, that resolution that I talked about had been granted uh, and Israel had been granted a, a homeland uh, for our Jewish people. And so um, we are going to sing that tonight as our closing song. Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu melech olam, bore pori hagafen. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Amen. 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 And we say L'chaim, meaning to life, because I think we realize more than perhaps at other times how precious life is and how quickly it can be taken away from us. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech olam, Amosi lechem min haaretz. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread and all manner of food from the earth. Amen. 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 Remember this Sunday, we're going to have a work day at our building, and we hope to see as many people there uh, who are willing to help us out, as uh, hopefully we are getting pretty close to completing the demolition and getting ready to start the molition. Um, <clears throat> now we would ask everyone to please stand. Uh, there's not really a word molition, I don't think. I kind of made that one up. There could be. You never know. When they stick prefixes in front of words, sometimes they're, you know, like uncouth. Well, couth is a word, too. Anyway, um, number six, verses 24 through 26, the Lord's words of blessing pronounced over his people long ago. Uh, and we pronounce those words uh, over the um, followers of Messiah tonight as the Lord's words of blessing. We encourage you to stand and receive these words of blessing this evening. Yevarechich Adonai v'yishmorecha Ya'er Adonai panavalecha v'chunecha Yisa Adonai panav alecha v'yasem lecha shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and show you his favor. May the Lord lift up his face toward you and give you peace. In the name of Messiah Yeshua, may we all go in peace. Amen. And now if our singers will come back up, we are going to be singing the Israeli national anthem called the Hatikva, which means the hope.
Shabbat Shalom. And have a blessed week. Enjoy the time of fellowship. Hope to see you on Sunday and Tuesday and Friday.